Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Now today I want to tell you about a very classical problem in linear algebra, a very natural one, and it's one which requires the theory of modules to understand and solve properly. Okay, it's called the N subspace problem, and to state it, uh, we use the following uh, notation. We start with positive integers N and D, and we look at subspaces wi of c to the d. And the problem is very simply to classify n tuples of these subspaces, w1 up to wn. And we want to classify these up to coordinate change. So you're allowed to change the coordinates here. And the point is that the best way to solve this problem or to study this problem is to use the theory of modules as I introduced in my video on why modules quivers. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves how that works. So the quiver that we want to have a look at, remember here a quiver is just a directed graph. The quiver will have n plus 1 vertices, they're listed 0 in the middle, and vertices 1, 2, all the way up to n around the outside. And there's going to be n directed edges going from the outside in. And so you can form, remember, this directed graph or quiver Q. And from that, we can form this ring or algebra over the complexes CQ. And just to remind you quickly, this ring here has basis over the complex numbers, just the paths that are inside this directed graph or quiver. And the point is that if we use this ring, we can reformulate this problem in a nice way using modules. And what's that? Basically, what we're looking at when we're looking at a situation like this is we're looking at a CQ module of the following form, where you have CD in the middle corresponding to the zero, and the subspaces W1, W2 around the outside. And of course, that means that these maps alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n, they have to be injective. And the problem that we want to solve here is to find out all these CQ modules up to isomorphism which have this form. Now, what does using module theory get us? What does it buy for us? Well, the first point to note is that when you're trying to study modules, especially ones of this form, all you need to do is to determine all the indecomposable modules, as every module is a direct sum of indecomposable modules. So that's the first observation to make, is that it suffices just to classify all the indecomposable CQ modules in this case. So what I want to do now is just to present some of the results uh, concerning this problem. Actually, it's an extremely difficult problem, even though it's just a problem in linear algebra. So the simplest case is called the Dinkin case. And that occurs when n, the number of subspaces, is 1, 2, or 3. In that case, what's the corresponding quiver? In the case n equals 1, you have a 0 and a 1 mapped to the 0. In the case n equals 2, the 0 is in the middle, and you have two vertices outside mapping to it. And in case n equals 3, you have a 0 and 3 vertices on the outside mapping to it. And one of the things that you might notice if you know a little bit of Lie theory is that these are very special types of quivers that arise all over mathematics called Dinkin quivers. They're examples of Dinkin quivers. This one corresponds to A2. This is A3. And this is D4. And there's a very celebrated theorem of Gabriel's which tells you all about the module theory of this path algebra, CQ, in this case, where n equals 1, 2, or 3. So basically, it states the following. It states that the number of indecomposable CQ modules in this case is just finite. And he moreover tells you more or less what they are and classifies them. They are classified by the positive roots corresponding to these Dinkin diagrams. Okay, so if you don't know about Lie theory and Dinkin diagrams, I can tell you very simply what happens in the case n equals 1. 
Actually, in the case n equals 1, you're just looking at one linear map. And so, of course, you can just study this just using the usual linear algebra. But it takes a rather interesting form when you do it this way. So what happens when n equals 1? Well, in this case, it turns out there, there are three positive roots. So there'll be three indecomposable modules. And let me tell you what they are. Firstly, remember to get a module, we need to give a vector space for each of the vertices and a linear map between them. So you can have just a one-dimensional vector space, C mapping to the one-dimensional vector space, by the identity. That's one indecomposable module. Another one is the zero vector space mapping to C. Of course, that has to be the zero map. And the final one is C mapping to zero. Of these three, the first two are injective linear maps, but the last one is not. So in answering our original question about determining, in this case, one subspace of CD, we only need to take direct sums of the first two modules. So what about when we increase n to the case n equals 4? What can we say in that case? Well, in that case, we're looking at CQ modules which have the following form, and one might note that in this case, the corresponding quiver is actually not a Dinkin diagram, but an extended Dinkin diagram. And in this case, it's just D4 tilde. And that's why we call it the extended Dinkin case. And here we also have a very nice theorem, although it's not so easy to state in complete detail. In this case, when n equals 4, there exists an infinite number of indecomposable CQ modules. And you can actually classify them, although it's a lot more difficult to state the classification. This classification relies on a very, very important theory in the representation theory of finite dimensional algebras, and that's called auslander writing theory. For us, all we'll do at the moment is see why there actually has to be an infinite number of such indecomposable modules by looking at a very special example where we just look at subspaces of C2 and all the subspaces are dimension 1. Okay, so let's have a little think about this situation. We're starting with C2, which is two-dimensional, and let's start by looking at the first subspace, W1. And remember, we're classifying these only up to change of coordinates. So since this is one-dimensional, we can make that W1 by changing coordinates on C2. W1 is just equal to C times 1, 0, say. What about W2? Well, W2 could be the same one-dimensional subspace, in which case you're more or less reduced to the case of three subspaces, the three subspace problem, or it's a different one. And if it's a different one, you can choose your basis on C2. So the W2 is equal to C times 0, 1. OK, what about W3? W3 could be the same as W1 or W2. And again, that reduces us to the three subspace problem. Or it could be something else. What other change of coordinates can you use? Well, you can still rescale along here and along here. And that will change the gradient of this subspace here. So we, in fact, we can fix it, as long as it's distinct from W2 and W1, to be W3 equals C times, for example, 1, 1. And now, once you do that, you've used up all your possible coordinate changes. So all you can do is just see where W4 lands after all these coordinate changes. And it lands wherever it lands. So W4 equals C times 
something like one lambda. And as you vary lambda, you'll get a different CQ module. And since there's one parameter worth of them, you'll find actually that there's a whole parameter worth of non-isomorphic in decomposable modules. What's very interesting in this case is that this lambda is related to the cross ratio that you see in projective geometry. If you know a little bit about projective geometry, you would know that one-dimensional subspaces of C2 correspond to points on the projective line. So here, you're basically just classifying four points on the projective line. And the way to do that is to use the cross ratio. Okay, well that's very nice. And it's quite interesting to see that the answer jumps remarkably from the Dinkin case over here, where n equals 1, 2, 3, to the extended Dinkin case that n equals 4. So let's look at the case where n is greater than or equal to 5. Well, this case is called the wild case. And why is it called the wild case? Well, it turns out that a complete solution to this problem is actually hopeless. And it's hopeless not because it's extremely difficult, but because we can actually prove in a certain sense that it is hopeless. Well, I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. To see more, you can see my website.